start now um, with my colleague Zahrib, who will give uh, an introduction about today's uh, webinar and uh, the double presentations that we want to give you today. So Arif, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much, Dear Nassim. Uh, hi, everyone from all around the world. Uh, the Green New Deal is being discussed in many countries around the world. In Germany, the Left Party and its affiliated political foundation, the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation, have a topic on the agenda. You can find a dossier with articles and debate contributions on the foundation's homepage at www.rosalux.de. Maybe, Alexander, you can share the homepage with us here on your screen. Is it possible? Alexander is uh, kindly our technical support. Anyway, um, I'm going on. Maybe Alexander can uh, manage it in a few seconds. Um, as, a, um, as a Brussels European office, we have also taken up the topic with the intention of discussing the different GND approaches, but also to lead the discussion for a global and social GND and to make proposals for the implementation of a Green New Deal on a global level. For this purpose, we have created a website. You can find the website at uh, www.red-green-new-deal.eu. Uh, maybe Alexander can also share uh, the homepage we built uh, just recently. The main idea behind this is to keep the debate up to date and to make it available, available um, to a broad public. Juliana Schumacher's publication, but also the launch on the website are the location for today's webinar. In her book, Juliana first discusses the historical New Deal and economic and social reform in the USA in the 1930s and links this approach to the pressing issue of environmental and social crisis. She then takes up various existing proposals in her book and discusses them in detail with her advantages, but also with all the disadvantages. You can download the book for free as a PDF file from the Red Green New Deal homepage in both uh, German and English. Yeah, I am um, very happy that we have Juliane in our event and that she will discuss the GND concepts for a social and ecological transformation together with Maria Teresa Nera Loron from the Philippines and Alex Lentana uh, from South Africa. With that, um, I turn back to you, Nassim. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Arif. And uh, I would like now to thank a lot our three panelists today for, for joining us. And I will, uh, with no more time, introduce them um, to, to, to you. So um, Juliana Schumacher is uh, an academic journalist and an activist with a focus on climate change and geoecology and uh, with a, a specialization on the Middle East and the North African region. At the University of Potsdam, where Juliana, you're part of a working group called um, Politics of Resources. So very, thank you very much for, for joining us today. Our um, second panelist uh, uh, today um, is uh, Alexander Leferna, who's uh, based in South Africa, who's a South African climate justice campaigner, who's um, now working with uh, 350africa.org. Uh, Alex, you also serve as the secretary of the Climate Justice Coalition, a coalition of South African trade unions, civil society grassroots, and community-based organizations. And you previously also worked in academia and uh, pursued research at the intersection of philosophy and climate justice. And last but not least, my dear colleague, Maria Teresa Loron, who's the advisor for the United Nations program at the Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung Center for International Dialogue and Cooperation and a lifetime global justice campaigner and advocate. So we can see that today we have a panel full of expertise in many fields and among them uh, climate change and, and, and development policies, but also with a huge amount of hands-on knowledge on movements and islands, and islands building, um, specifically in the global south context. And this intersection of, of knowledge and experiences will be key for our discussion. 
and the task of um, unpacking the, the large book uh, uh, that we, and, and very dense book that uh, we have the pleasure to, to publish and, and to present to you today. Um, and we'll, we'll try to, to create a discussion between this book uh, that you wrote, Juliane, and the experiences and knowledge of our panelists on fighting for structural changes and climate justice on the ground, bringing voices that have been historically exploited and marginalized in the forefront of the struggle. So we really welcome this publication in the Brussels office. As for this is also a continuation of the work that we've, uh, that we've been doing uh, together also with the, the New York office um, as um, the work on the Green New Deal, um, where we are trying to propose a, a platform to discuss the, the different, those different proposals and demands and explore their potential of concrete changes um, that they offer to, to achieve at, at the national, regional or global level. So slightly more than a year ago, we, at the start of the, the pandemic, we launched a, a webinar series together with, with the, the, the New York office called the Green New Deal, the, North, the World Needs Now. And we dive into the, the different um, sectors uh, that the, the US proposal for a Green New Deal was offering. And with this book, one year later, we have reached another step. Um, the, the, the discussions have been enriched and many other proposals have, uh, have emerged since then and found the space in the talks about Green New Deals. The calls for a feminist Green New Deal, the Pacto Ecosocial del Sur, um, or uh, the, the South Africa Claim as Justice Charter uh, between, uh, among, be, being among uh, those, those proposals. And this book, I think, is, do, is doing the, the real tour de force to present uh, all those developments in a very didactic way. And it's also, uh, I think, a starting point uh, that we could use to explore the many crucial nodes that we need to be, to de to, that needs to be precise uh, and, and dig, dig it upon if we want to build a, a program able to advance um, so, such, such demands. So the, the, the question of financing will be key, the international trade and technology, the, the digitalization and uh, of course the food system and agriculture as well will be uh, maybe part of further discussions and, and, and maybe we will also discuss them a bit today. Uh, but let me start with, with uh, today's discussions and my first question is uh, directed to you, uh, Juliane. So in your book, in many occurrences, you, you, you mentioned the question of the scale of the Green New Deal. And you highlight that its uh, proposal have been made at different scale, the municipal or city scale, the national, the nation state scale, and, and transnational levels. So according to your analysis, what is the current state of the discussions around the global Green New Deal? And from whom, from whom are those demons coming from? Uh, thanks, Nassim. Uh, thanks um, first to the organizers for the chance to be here and to present a part of this work I have done on Green New Deals over the last year. Um, concerning the scales of the Green New Deal, I think that um, addressing the scalar issues in Green New Deals is like crucial to uh, advance a truly uh, progressive understanding of Green New Deals. Because uh, one of the key features of the Green New Deal is this combination of addressing both the climate crisis and, and the social in inequality. Because there's a lot of propositions on uh, uh, ecological transformation and green economy. But I think what really distinguishes the Green New Deal proposals is that they, they also address the social crisis, no? not just the ecological or the climate crisis. Um, but the social justice issue is in most proposals just thought on a national scale, like all the more advanced proposals for Green New Deals, especially the US ones, they think justice on a national scale. No? It's a lot about workers in the US, how they can like, how justice can be achieved in, in this frame of a nation, of nation state. 
And when I actually first started to do research on this issue and I talked to different activists and um, people involved in this um, US Green New Deal proposals, most of them really responded to me that global justice issues do not play any role in these debates. It's difficult enough to, uh, to bring together all these different voices within the US and the workers movement and unions and whatever. And, and, and actually they said, it's not discussed. We don't talk about global issues. And I think this still reflected in most proposals and um, because most of these proposals focus just on this national scale and they have been uh, when the first proposals were like published, there has been a lot of criticism also from the global source, but also from activists in the uh, in the global north. Um, saying that this version of a Green New Deal is just an update of this capitalist um, post-colonial or colonial extractivist scheme. No? So instead of importing oil and securing oil routes uh, militarily, uh, now they, have, they will import lithium or other um, natural resources they need for their electric cars or their um, solar energy, whatever. So, so nothing will change, just the, the basis, like it's not fossil fuels anymore, it's now other other resources. So, um, and I think this criticism has, has been taken up in parts by some proposals, but still this issue of global justice is, justice is very limited in most proposals of Green New Deals. And um, so I found more or less three approaches how global justice issues were taken up in Green New Deal proposals. And one is on this a national scheme, like most more progressive proposals for Green New Deals, they somehow address this issue by saying, okay, we need these imports, we need uh, resources from the global south, but we have to see that it's done in a fair way. So we need some regulations, um, some criteria, what, uh, how can we ensure that uh, resources produced brought in from the global south or, or supply chains can, um, can be controlled, that there's like some certificates or there's also this notion of supply chain justice, what is a bit more advanced, not to say, okay, we have to, to bring people together working on the supply, along the supply chains to work in solidarity, um, to connect with each other um, or we have to see that for example we take our fair share like this is for example the Sanders proposal um, to say okay we have to reduce our emissions more than we um, said in the Paris agreement because we are responsible like historically for much more emissions than than we are at the moment so these are like different and for example the green new deal for europe they include uh they propose uh, uh what are they called environmental justice commission <laughs> so that could be like look that all the supply chains are according to some environmental justice criteria um so these different um ideas of how to ensure that at least the green new deal done in an global north, north country does not harm the global south more than necessary and then there's the second um, proposal is for green new deals to do actually green new deals in the global in countries of the global south um, saying that it's not just the north who needs the green new deal it's not just the uk or the us but also in other in countries of the global south, a Green New Deal is needed. And there are, for example, these proposals most prominently from Latin America, like activists who said, okay, we, we need to develop the same kind of proposals for, um, for example, Argentina or Mexico. Or, and there are also proposals from Tunisia or from Malaysia. They are not as as concrete as the US ones, for example, but there are some ideas how this concept could be translated to countries of the global south. Um, and there are like a lot of other proposals that do not use this term global Green New Deal, but go in the same direction, combining social justice and uh, ecological transformation. I think Alex can tell us more about this because uh, as, uh, for, for example, in South Africa, there's, I think this discussion is going on for much longer <laughs> already. And there are a lot of proposals coming from there that do not call themselves Green New Deals. Um, and then there's truly like 
this what you asked me about <laughs> global green new deals like really green new deals that go beyond one national nation state and um actually there are not a lot of very concrete proposals for this uh, we have at the moment this contrast between very concrete and um, comprehensive political proposals for nation states um, and very vague demands for a kind of a global version for Green New Deals, for example, in the feminist Green New Deals, they are much more radical and also much, much more advanced in the demands, but they are not as concrete. It's not really a political program that can be just like uh, implemented. No, it's more this uh, more kind of collection of different demands. Um, by social movements and um, for in this global aspect um, there's different versions there's one there are some people calling for like to, to strengthen the, the existing um, international institutions for example also in many green new deals they say okay we have to give more money for example to the green climate fund or the to the UNFCCC and, and they have to dis distribute it. This is also in Sanders, also Biden now announced he will pay more money to the Green Climate Fund. And I think this is a very questionable uh, way because these institutions already work, most of them at the moment in a certain way. And it's not ensured that this money will really reach the people who really need it most. But this is one, one proposal to use the existing institutions. There's also um, the second, way would be like kind of a coalition. I think this is what Anne Petty for, for example, is proposing in her in her writing that she says, okay, there will not not every country on the world will join this movement for Green New Deals. But if you have several countries implementing Green New Deals, they could form a coalition or corporations among each other, support each other in this um, transition. So it's kind of a coalition of like minded states in uh, concerning a Green New Deal. And the third idea would be really a global Green New Deal with the creation of new institutions. There are very few demands for this. Um, the global Green New Deal has, the, the term has been used also within the U United Nations already from 2008, 2009 on, but for rather neoliberal green economy programs. Um, there are some, there's one proposal, for example, by uh, Varoufakis and Adler, um, who have like called for a new institution of um, a kind of the same kind of Marshall Plan that was implemented after the Second World War in Europe, a new institution um, who would then finance the, this transition in different countries of the world. So, but apart from these proposals, there are very few ideas for really a global Green New Deal. And I think this discussion is just starting. Like how how can I think there's a huge demand for this uh, combination of uh, addressing both climate crisis and social inequality. And it shows how many people take this up, this idea. Um, but I think the discussion about how to integrate also the issue of global justice into this is just starting. And so I think this is what we what we do now know and what, what should also be, be done more and more discussed more over the next next months maybe. Thank you very much, uh, Juliana, for, for, for this very good overview and already um, showing the, the, the different proposals and, and the question of, of the institutions that can, that can carry those, those demands and, um, and what could be uh, the, the, yeah, what, what could be the best channel to carry those, those global demands? That's, that, that's uh, the, one of the key questions. I would like now maybe to, to turn to, to Alex and to, to go to the, to, the, to the Global South and to ask um, how are the, the, those Green New Deal talks and discussions or global Green New Deals maybe uh, echoing in South Africa? And if the demands around the, the just transitions that are emanating from climate and, and workers' movements um, in, in, in South Africa and, and maybe in the continent as well are in a way transferable or can find a place into uh, the, demand for a, the demands for a global Green New Deal, the proposal for a global Green New Deal. 
Thanks very much, Nassim, and, and thanks everybody. Pleasure to be here with you. Um, yeah, I think to, to start off with, there certainly is a, a rich history in South Africa of engagement around a more transformative vision of climate justice, which I think is at the heart of most Green New Deal um, visions, right? It's something that's a bit more radical that gets to the, the root causes, the systemic uh, drivers of the climate crisis and that works to tackle the economic system underpinning it driven by you know, profiteering and extraction. Um, so for example, in 2000, in early 2010s, there was the 1 million climate job campaign in South Africa, which was driven by a coalition of trade unions of civil society organizations that were trying to you know, put together a program that addresses not only the climate crisis, but the deep um, crisis of unemployment, inequality and poverty that we have here in South Africa. So it was very much about driving an employment program that would work to tackle both the social and the ecological crises that we face here in South Africa as you know, one of the world's most unequal um, countries. Um, but what is interesting, I think, about South Africa is that it's also a microcosm of global inequalities, because even though South Africa is the most unequal country, if you measure the Gini coefficient of South Africa, it's about the same as the global Gini coefficient, right? Um, and so we're living in some ways in a global ap apartheid in terms of the in levels of economic inequality that we have resembling South Africa's. So I think that does really speak to the need to, to really have inequality and poverty at the heart of the global Green New Deal. Um, you know, more recent instantiations of something that echo that sort of Green New Deal type framing is the climate justice charter movement here in South Africa, which is being driven by uh, the uh, Cooperative Policy and Alternative Center um, and, and is trying to think about a sort of an eco-socialist framing of how to transform South Africa um, and is also grounded in the history of uh, charters in South Africa. We had the Freedom Charter that was part of the anti-apartheid movement um, another place where we have some echoes, we've got a Green New ESCOM campaign driven here by the Climate Justice Coalition, and that's about transforming our uh, national utility ESCOM, which is the biggest polluter on the continent and is very reliant on coal. Um, and here again, it's we're partnering with more radical trade unions like the South African Federation of Trade Unions, who actually suggested that name to us for the campaign, um, as well as working with um, communities that are impacted by energy injustice, by lack of energy access as a result of our very centralized and polluting uh, coal power uh, system here in South Africa, which harms many. Um, maybe to just focus on one element that is, I think, resonating a lot in, in this particular context, but I think in a lot of other Global South contexts is around debt. I think there's two elements of the debt question. One is that you know, many countries in the global south are quite deeply indebted, and now with the COVID pandemic, that is deepening that significantly, right? To the point where, you know, if you look at the investments needed for a Green New Deal and a global Green New Deal, those investments really would benefit countries in the long run. It would help with socioeconomic development, it would, could help with addressing inequality and poverty. But a lot of the time, there's this sort of debt trap that is holding back countries from being able to make that investment. And a lot of that debt traces back to colonial histories and neo-colonial practices, right? Um, and so there's this big question of how we address debts at the, at the core of the Global Green New Deal. And on the other hand, there's this lack of payment of climate debt from the global north. And I think even though the scales of what, for example, the Biden administration is talking about for international climate finance is minuscule, compared to what is owed. Whereas the US invests trillions locally in their Green New Deal, they offer a billion for the rest of the globe to pay for their transition. It's just, in some ways, it's it's a pittance um, and it seems more tokenistic than substantive. Um, so maybe I'll leave it there um, because I know we've got a lot to get through today. Thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, Alex. And, and thank you for already pointing out some yeah, some very important uh, and key issue, the, the, the question of debts. I was maybe thinking that we would, we could maybe um, 
go a bit through it through it later, but it's it's really good that we already touched upon it because I think that all our panelists could have something to to bring on on, on that uh, on that that aspect. And um, I will I will now go to to Tete and, and ask you. I mean, in the book of Julian Schumacher, the the there is the, the mention of the, the feminist Green New Deal, and we, we just briefly talk about it as, a, as an approach which is both critical and uh, somehow complementary to the proposal uh, made by, um, um, carried by, the, by Ocasio Cortez in the US. So how do you see the demand from a feminist Green New Deal intersecting with um, the, the, the claims and struggles that are coming from the different movements in the global south. Thanks very much, Nassim, and um, hello, everyone. Um, I think I would digress a little bit from your precise question by saying that for many feminist um, social movements coming from the global south, our conception is that of a decolonial feminist global Green New Deal. So it's already expanding from just merely being a feminist Green New Deal to really touching, you know, the, the heart, the core of um, underdevelopment, poverty and inequality affecting women, particularly in the global south. So decolonial feminist global Green New Deal, the term is quite new and frankly, it's um it's being discussed and articulated in a relatively small circle of civil society or social movement intelligentsia. Now, so it's not as a, a broad a discussion that we're having on the topic at the moment, but this does not make the concept abstract. Now, let me get it straight. We just haven't had the opportunity yet for a broader debate of this kind of framing. But when you unpack the essence of a decolonial feminist global Green New Deal, you will see that this captures what feminist and social movements in the global south have been struggling for decades, uh, centuries already. And that is essentially, you know, systemic changes and macro solutions that would work for women, people, and planet. So I think that also... Um, brings us to an appreciation of what are some of the things that could be considered positives in the current um, GND debates, as well as some of the negatives. No? I think for one, it's very good that we have a label. You know, there's already a term that somehow captures into a set of policy prescriptions policy directives you know that could be acted upon by legislation could be acted upon by parliaments executive offices so i think i appreciate that a lot no because now it's no longer just um confined to shouting in the streets or in demonstrations that we call for radical changes in the way societies are structured, in the way countries relate with each other. Yeah, so I think as a, as a concept, it's very good that you now have a name to this set of policy prescriptions. And I think I also appreciate that there is an openness to debate the merits of, an advan of advancing an alternative paradigm. Okay, so those are two good things that I can immediately think about. But in terms of what's kind of missing or a little bit weak at the moment, is that I, I have yet to really see or hear or read about, you know, a Green New Deal that talks about, you know, um, the kind of transformations that are needed to actually see this through. Because this transformations go beyond what the institutions of multilateral governance at the moment can offer. No? Even we're talking about the TRIPS waiver earlier, and that in itself is already an indication. No? It's, it's one provision, but it's really, really an uphill climb. So how much more if you're talking about macro solutions on the way, you know, um, the trade, economic, and financial architectures globally are structured? 
So there are limits yet to how the Green New Deal discussions are capturing or not you know, what, trans what the limits of transformations that institutions of multilateral governance can bring. And I think the second um, weakness at the moment is that for me, I think there is a, a lack of understanding of how power dynamics, institutions, and mechanisms to maintain the status quo at global, regional, and country level are going to play out. You know, it's as if, for me, as, as if the discussions on the Green New Deal can solve all the world's problems via legislation. And that's quite naive, no? Because if you look at the situation now, for instance, in the Philippines, defenders of the environment get killed, harassed, intimidated, jailed, you know? These are structures where you see the interplay of the police, the military, institutions of uh, repression and suppression, uh, together with uh, the judiciary, etc. It's the whole system. So while it essentially talks about system change, I think, yeah, the Green New Deals now are quite deficient in articulating how this will be made possible, recognizing the interplay of, you know, the state, the military, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But nonetheless, you no, know, a decolonial feminist global Green New Deal is about appending the structures that deplete wealth, resources, nature in the global south to fuel the consumption for the most wealthy and an economy that relies in unpaid domestic care work from women or one that pays you know, marginalized women precariously to undertake this kind of labor. So in effect, um, the unpaid domestic care work, um, you know, um, huge, uh, huge pay, gender pay gaps, we are subsidizing this kind of infrastructure that creates you know, the 1% elite. So I'll stop there, and uh, I think it's uh, going to be controversial later on. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Tetet. There, there is a, a lot to, to unpack with what you said, but um, um, I understand. I, I will highlight the, the, the question of power dynamics and uh, what you were say, uh, saying. Uh, a lack of understanding, like often those proposals are not understanding uh, or miss or maybe um, missing the, the 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 real power dynamics, the real uh, difficulties also for for uh, for movement in the global south to uh, to carry uh, those kind of demands that could seem. Um, Legitimate or easy, maybe for for campaigners in the global north, so that they, that they see as a as a prerequisite already. Um, so I think this is a this is an interesting question, and and maybe that could lead to a, uh, another question that I that would like to to ask the the three of you. So in terms of maybe we need to criticize a bit or to to at least to to, to play the advocate devil and and see what are um, the weaknesses uh, of of the the global green new deal um, demands uh, to to really um, bring uh, and carry systemic changes, uh, or maybe what are the the demands and the the the, the features that it would need to that those those call for global green new deals need to integrate to be uh, more um, to, to fit the, the, the power dynamics in the global south uh, and to be maybe more easily appropriated by social movements uh, in the in the south fighting for, for global justice. Um, so that's um, maybe a, a, a complex question. I don't know who who wants to to start if um, if if uh, Juliana or, or Alex because they did just spoke who wants to to try to maybe give an answer or to reflect on that. Alex? You... I, I can also start. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think there are two weaknesses. Um, and one is like um, related to temporal um, uh, issues and the other to spatial issues. <laughs> um, 
one weakness I find important is this uh, that especially in the US Green New Deals, but also in the European proposals for Green New Deals, um, most of these Green New Deals, they relate back to the past, you no, know, in a often very idealized and sometimes a very nostalgical way, you no. Know? Um, it, it's 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 understandable because like this idea of a green new deal relates to the new deal in the US, you no, know, that was a proposal and and many features and many measurements are really taken one to one like exactly from this new deal proposal, but also this. Um, the problem is that they also copy some of the problems of the original New Deal. Uh, and I think many things, what's like the point now is like to see what has changed since then, no? Uh, and I think we cannot answer the, the questions of today with some um, ideas from the past. We have to think beyond this and we have to, to see that we develop like new paths for the future. Um, we can learn from the past, but we cannot copy this model and uh, implement it now. We have to see, like, what do we need now, no? And, and this will not be exactly the same that it was, like, uh, 70 years ago. So I think this is one important point, <laughs> to be a bit more creative about, like, developing new ideas um, and not just looking what what existed before. And uh, the other point is the special point. I think this is what we already talked about, that most of these uh, issues are related to this national scale. And I think there's a lot of possibilities beyond this. Uh, and even in the where there's a proposal for a global Green New Deal, it's often thought as a coalition of nation states. And I think there are other possibilities. No, like there can be coalitions of social movements. There can be coalitions of producer of the same goods in different places around the world. There can be coalitions of um, small farmers in the North and the South, because sometimes they share the same problems, no, against big corporations. There can be coalitions of, uh, I don't know, Ted had mentioned this gender issue, no. So I think there's a lot of, um, ways of cooperating politically and of forming associations beyond this national uh, state scheme. And I think we have to go beyond this and form, think beyond this. Also, not just, also in, in relation to this debt issue, for example, uh, to say, okay, one state is paying uh, reparations to another state. It's not said that, let's say, Modi in India will bring this, like give this money to the people who are most affected by climate change. No, it's, I think there are much more power dynamics and structures um, beyond this. And I think this is what is it. So these are two, two weaknesses, I think. There are the other ones, but this is the first, the two ones I want to mention at the beginning. Thanks a lot, Juliana. It's uh, really, really interesting. And I think we keep going back to the question of the, the, the scale and the institutions. And we, I think there is a very good question also in the, from the audience, but now we will hear Alex and and uh, come back later. Thanks. Yeah, I think it's useful to think about what shouldn't re represent a, a global Green New Deal and the problematic practices. And to to riff a bit off Tete here, um, when we think about maybe two examples that really demonstrate how our current clean energy system is being built through really problematic power relations by some of the the more hegemonic forces and in the world right now, we can think um, about my unfortunate um, South African friend, Elon Musk, and the jokes he makes about cooing Bolivia um, and uh, pushing back against those that are trying to push for a more um, sort of just resource nationalism in, in the global South against the sort of extractive multinational corporations that are trying to gobble up all the resources um, needed to, to fuel a clean energy industry we can also think about there was a recent report showing that much of China's solar panels are manufactured through the use of Uyghur um, forced labor, right? Um, and if this is these are the engines that are building our clean energy future, we really do need to worry about um, you know what are the power relations that are still very present, um, particularly with the U.S. example. You know that is backed that 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 sort of neo imperialism is not just soft power it's very hard military power that backs that with the US military being one of the biggest polluters and also one of the most violent enforcers of our current uh, structure and i think there's there is some um, discussion of that in the US you know the green party's platform was very much about defunding the military 
and using that to fund instead a global Green New Deal. And I think that call for defund the police, defund the military is a really important element of demilitarizing our global space so that we can fight for a more just order, not one that is so violently policed, often um, to suppress um, resistance in the global south that is trying to put forward a different development paradigm. So I'll leave that there. Thanks. Thanks a lot, uh, Alex. Uh, um, Teta, do you want to go more into the, the critics? Well, actually, uh, Juliana and Alex already mentioned a lot already. You know, and I'm really happy that we have an awesome panel here. But I would like to center again on the need for macro solutions. You know, the norm setting function that the United Nations is supposed to have. It's supposed to exercise leadership we sorely lack that at the moment. No? So I don't know if the question is, do you build a different UN? I say we reclaim the UN for what it is uh, originally meant to be. No? After all, the UN Charter says, we the people. So the people should reclaim this institution of global governance rather than you know, allowing a corporate agenda to corporate interests to run the development agenda. So there's also this danger that, you know, because people want to be hopeful, people want to see results that work, that the tendency is to look at pocket-sized solutions at community level and say, see, this works, let's replicate, let's scale up. But it's not as simple as, uh, you know, replicating and scaling up. So I think that's one real danger that without looking at the need for macro solutions and uh, challenging the existing trade, economic, and financial dynamics, you know, we might lead to a bigger but romanticized version of those pocket-sized solutions, which will not really address you know, um, the need for systemic changes. I think current discourse also on the Green New Deal uh, has a danger of uh, leading us into technology worship like, you know, go 100% renewable, uh, um, fossil fuel free, etc. But without questioning or altering um, structures of ownership, etc. in control, 100% renewable energy will not save the planet from climate crisis. You, know? <laughs> you get what I'm saying? No? So central to the Green New Deal discussions is redistributive justice and environmental integrity. So and it really brings us um, to the bigger questions, for instance, that um, um, we need to center re redistributive justice in our understanding of what an economy is for and how it functions. Um, Alex and uh, Liliana mentioned earlier the need to address the debt crisis, but it goes more than the debt crisis. No? How do you redistribute you know, income, wealth, power, and opportunities? One could be uh, instituting progressive taxation at the, at the global level. And civil society has already been demanding for a UN tax body, which Germany does not support. No? <laughs> um, there's also um, a lot of ground to tackle uh, illicit financial flows. And it's not just about the corruption, but it's also about unprofit shifting um, practices of transnational corporations that already lead to the fact that it's actually the global south that's subsidizing the profits of this um, uh, transnational corporations based in the north. Now, um, there's a relatively uh, high level of acceptance about ending fossil fuel subsidies, but we have yet to see if it's it goes more than just a uh, lip service. No? So a lot of things that uh, instead of spending on harm we should divest from harm and start investing in care now so when alex mentioned defund the police defund the military that is a concrete step where how we can divest from harm and start investing in in a care economy now so those things we need to really um uh bring on the table and uh try to get broader ownership uh among social movements, and I think the public at large. It's not just limited to the civil society and social movement intelligentsia. Wow, thanks a lot, uh, Tetet. And, and 
and thanks a lot uh, yeah to, to to the three of you for for this uh very enlightening uh, um discussion now and i think i mean this has also um inspired our our audience who's asking very interesting uh, 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 questions um and two questions are on the, the 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 institutional question and i think this goes back to what Juliana was saying, and also just right now, what what Tated was saying. So the question of Juliana was mentioning that the scale of the national uh, of the nation states is often the can be also often seen as a as a limitation and as a problem in itself to to address those questions. And Tated was uh, mentioning the the fact that we don't we but we we need those. Um, we still need to think of large scale solutions and, and, and global solutions. So we still need to, to find to whom those, um, to those claims, those demands to defend some key aspects and to found some new ones should be addressed too. And, and this, the, so the question is, the, the questions that are coming are, are based on those, uh, th those points. So, should we actually try to uh, have those concrete discussions at the UN level, the World Social Forum? Are there new institutions emerging from these discussions that can take place? Or the second question uh, was going to more into the details, trying to, um, should, we, um, should we try to fix, for example, the IMF that was initially, or that, that was implemented with the, uh, the, the the power uh, conditions that we know but that was implemented at the at the so at the global level do we do we try to build an alternative to the imf and how do we relate to existing existing alternatives like chinese financing which has provided a valuable alternative to the imf for countries um who do who do want to uh, accept imf conditionality so do we think outside of the existing uh, institutions and which kind of institution then do we want, or do we try to fix the existing constitutions? Who wants to um, to start this big task? Juliano, I see. I think you are about. Should I start again? <laughs> we can. Uh, okay, I, I think. Um... This relates to different question that also Teta Tet has already mentioned. No, I think it's a problem that um, uh, if you want to implement a global Green New Deal or just think about a concrete global Green New Deal, the question is who to address, no, and which structure to address because there is no global government. This is much easier on a national scale because you have a nation state and a government, and uh, for example, that can raise taxes. This is a very important point, and. Um, um, I think we do not have this on a global level. So it's about like, this is the question how to reform the existing institution. I, I agree with Tete that, that um, most of this UN system institutions did, do have, or they had a, a progressive core. No, they have this core values they were built with that still exist and they can be referred to. No, um, So, I'm not an expert in internal UN structures, if it's possible to reform them from, from the inside, um, or if it's necessary or easier to build new structures. But I think what we do need is a form of global structure um, also to address global inequality. And I think this relates also back to a lot of discussions that already are not not limited to climate issues or to environmental issues because this was all discussed in the 90s and beginning of 2000s already in this like globalist movements you know, when it was about trade and social justice and globalization I think and this is a lot of uh, there's already a lot of knowledge one can draw on when thinking about um, this global injustices um, but I want to like I think I feel important that to address this issue of macro macro structures because I, I really agree with Tetet because I'm not sure how it is in other countries but in the global north at the moment we have this problem that a lot of what I would call very progressive social movements especially from an 
climate justice or environmental justice point, they're very much fixed on this local level solutions. So it's about um, creating small community gardens or about um, building like small housing projects, whatever. And I feel this is really important and it's important to try out alternatives, but this is not a solution to for, for, for a global problem like climate change. We, we do need this macro structures. Um, and we do need ideas how to deal with this really global problems on a different level. So, uh, and I think this is something that a lot of people from also the growth movements and um, and also this environmental justice movements we have at the moment in Germany do not really address. No, they stay on this uh, local scale. Um, and I think this is what we have to get in, into dialogue with each other. How how this how how these um, experiences from this level can be used and can and how they can interact with this. Uh, but like put on another scale no, to address this really global issues. And, and there will be conflicts between these levels. No, You already have this in the US. And I think this is a very important point because in the US, you already have these discussions. What is about um, if you say you want to have, a, to, to have more regenerative energy on a national scale, this will have impact on some local communities. And for example, if you want to make houses more energy efficient, uh, this will affect a lot of communities on the ground that maybe defend their old houses where they can live in a certain way, whatever. So this, there will be conflicts between different levels already on a national scale, but this will even be bigger on a, on a global scale. So I think this is a discussion that has to start. And, and I, I don't see any really ideas at the moment for this global level, but this has to be created. And I think there's a lot of ideas one can draw on. And the second point I want to mention is about this, uh, what, what Ted had also said about this, this problem or this danger of getting into a techno fix, no? To say, okay, we just changed to another technology. And, and I think there's a, a huge array of possibilities within these Green New Deals that is discussed, no? There's a very, there are some ways that are very much in this techno fix direction saying, okay, we just need to develop um, new technologies and 100% renewables. And the, But there's also a, a very wide array of other possibilities in the US, there's also a lot of this um, care issues are intensively discussed. And there are a lot of ideas coming up and saying, okay, we do, if we really want to have a Green New Deal, it cannot be about production, we don't need industrial jobs, we need care jobs, and these jobs that should be created within a Green New Deal that needs to be jobs in childcare, in care for elderly people, we need to reform our health system, and these are climate neutral or climate friendly jobs, no, it's not producing uh, electric cars. So, so I think this is, uh, it, it can go in both directions, no, it can be very uh, industrial fixed on industrial workers, like in the 60s, and it can take a new direction and it will depend on who joins and who pushes it in which direction if what comes out at the end. No? Thank you very much, Juliana, and or, to, for uh, also opening new, new, ways of, uh, of well new yeah new roads uh, to to think about and and the difference between the industrial development and and and, the, and what is what is development in a way what, what kind of change we we need to see in our productive system um i, I would be interested now to have the Ted's opinion on the, the the question of the the institutions and the un uh because i I've, I know you've been working a lot within those uh, forums, so I think you have a, a, a lot to lot to share, and I would be interested to to hear your view. Um, thank you so much. Um, I'm not an expert on the UN. It's it it's it still amazes me. No, it's a it's a it's a maze. The whole structure, the whole institution is a maze. But I think for the moment, um, civil society and social movements who engage with the United Nations have been really trying to push for, you know, a stronger UN that goes back to its original mandate of, you know, uh, decolonization, uh, human development, you know, those core principles that were 
uh, with which the UN was founded 75 years ago. So a lot has happened and we now say we have a very weak UN because it's the corporations that drive the agenda. No, um, it's a um, uh, rich country versus a uh, poor country. Those uh, lines are ever so clear at the moment, which is why we're saying that the problem now is that in this space where supposedly, you know, all countries have a voice, some voices are louder than the others. And we need to um, make sure that developing countries um, voice are not drowned out by rich countries' voice and um, corporate voices. So what we're saying is, um, for instance, uh, in this um, um, context of the pandemic especially, what developing countries need right now is not just the fiscal space, but fiscal sovereignty. No, They need to be able to drive their own agenda, um, but they cannot do that because they're very much saddled by the debt problem. So, of course, the IMF, the G7, they said there's a debt service suspension initiative until end of the year fine that's so good that's so generous of you but what about you know why why these countries are heavily indebted in the first place you know why go why not go to the roots of the debt problem when actually it's the south that subsidizes the north for centuries because of colonialism because of you know uh, the continuing legacy of unfair trade and investment deals that extracts from our natural resources you know you process into your uh, high-tech manufacturing sector and then you dump everything back in the third world <laughs> as high-priced imports so that's a very very vicious debt spiral no that um, um, we find ourselves in. There's also the question of the lack of tax justice. There's also the question of the uh, World Trade Organization uh, rules on investor uh, state dispute settlement. You know, can you imagine the trade rules now allows corporations to sue governments for uh, trying to do the right thing for their own citizens? You know, like insuring food, insuring medicines, insuring vaccines. Governments can be sued and are being sued by these corporations. Um, there's also lack of, of financial regulation. So there are a lot of things, practical things that can be done at the multilateral level that would send the right signals. No, so that is why we're saying we in civil society are calling for an international summit for reconstruction. Because even though governments say, business as usual cannot happen it's actually more business than usual now you know now it's a debt suspension initiative while loan conditionalities are being rolled out as we speak in the same breath so the left hand gives you debt suspension the right hand gives you you know more structural adjustment programs that talks about austerity uh, privatization so you know it's really crazy that's why we're calling for you know uh, the un to spearhead this international summit for economic reconstruction you know th to go uh, to make sure that economies uh, post pandemic are allowed the fiscal space to, to imagine a future for the people. Thanks a, thanks a lot, Tetez, again, for this um, very, um, very dense thoughts. Um, and I would like to, to, to go to, to Alex now to, to receive his, his views on the question of the institutions as well. Thanks for this. Um, I think there's a, there's a good question there about institutions institutions also in terms of procedural justice and how we go about creating a global green new deal. Um, you know, there's a question by Michael there about how do we ensure that voices of the global south are driving this process, right? Um, and I think that's, that's a really vital question. Um, you know, I, I think there's, there's two elements to it. One is actually providing the resources so that the global south can be at the table. It costs time, it costs money to be part of these discussions, right? And there's a lot of civil society movements that are not as well funded as the global North. And so it is difficult to be in these spaces sometimes. 
Um, and here, I think there's a lot of fingers that need to be pointed at global NGOs, global funders. Um, you know, they talk about the need for a global Green New Deal, but then they've got this team of like 50 located in a global North country, and then they expect like five people to co cover all of Africa, right? Um, or something like that. There, there's these sorts of dynamics that often occur within the, the funder and NGO spaces that make it very difficult for, for organizations in the global south to have the capacity to really be in these spaces. And you see that from the grassroots up to the UN level where you know you have the US sending an army of negotiators compared to least developed countries who can send one to cover like the entire space, right? There are very deep procedural injustices that mean that you know those voices aren't being heard there, right? But even when those voices are speaking out, they're often ignored. So I have the example here of the World People's Conference on Climate Change and the Rights of Mother Earth that happened back in Bolivia back in, I think, 2010 even, right? Um, and it would be really interesting to see the, that recognized more and the, and the Global Green New Deal thinking about some of those discussions that have happened, right? Um, and, you know, there's this term of Columbusing where we pretend we've discovered something new. The Global Green New Deal framework sometimes feels like it's a little bit of Columbusing what's already been discussed in a lot of those global south spaces, right? Um, which is not to say that there isn't a lot of good stuff going on under the Global Green New Deal banner, but there has been really rich discussions in other forums in the global south. And so in addition to having to invest in those voices, I think we also need to do better to listen to them too when they are speaking out. I'll leave it there. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Thanks, thanks to all of you for for going for diving more into the, this question. Um, and there are a lot of very good questions coming from the from the audience. Maybe I would like, if you can say one or two words about uh, a specific question about transnational global South solidarity. Uh, you you're saying that we need to gain those spaces, the global South need to build uh, those those alliances to 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 bring these those demands that has mentioned the tax demands and the, you, Alex also the, the, the debt question. Um, how do we build uh, transnational global South alliances? And how maybe the global movement in the global North can be supporting those demands as well. Who wants to 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 start? It can be just a few words, but I think it's important in, um, at this time of the conversation. Okay, I can try. <laughs> Wonderful. All right. Um, I think in the same way that we criticize and challenge, you know, um, mainstream institutions to go beyond their siloed approaches. I think the same recommendation and challenge can be said to social movements. So this is a criticism of us no, in the movement because we say that, yes, we should be holistic, everything is interconnected, we know the drill, but in practice, it's quite difficult for us to actually break from our own silos. You know what I'm saying? Uh, for instance, in the climate justice movement, um, it was very, very difficult to talk to uh, workers, trade unions on the topic of just transition. Why? Because there are fundamental tensions. No, this is our interest as a you know a hard hard fought gains of the labor movement of trade unions etc and now the climate justice movement is saying what so you know uh, there are tensions that could be um deep seated tensions already that could come into fore whenever you talk about uh how one advocacy could probably trump another advocacy 
could no i'm not saying it does but the lack of um appreciation of how things are really interconnected and how you know our struggles are also interconnected so i think we need to walk the talk <laughs> That's a self-criticism no? for us in the movement. We need to walk the talk also. Um, we need to connect those dots because we know the dots are there. We need to do that. No? Um, I think what's also important is um, for us to broaden this conversation into a public debate instead of us fighting among ourselves among each other uh, on these issues about how climate versus workers etc cetera, etc cetera. we should be actually uh, trying to uh, reach out to the broader public so that you know we could raise this uh, important questions around power dynamics where it could be addressed now, instead of us arguing among ourselves maybe just some thoughts alex juliana your turn these are very big big questions you <laughs> you are asking us you know um i think one point when i was doing the research i, I thought is important that it's not always about doing things but sometimes also about not doing things as especially in north south relations um because we already had this topic of the de defunding no um and I think this applies to a lot of things. No, this can apply to like even if you don't have a concept for for like doing things in a better way. Sometimes maybe it would already um, be enough to stop the most harmful things you're doing. This can be like uh, subsidies for fossil fuels, for example. No, just to stop them would already um, help a lot. And the same is true with um, with this military thing. I, I did not know before how big the US military uh, is, but it's actually really three quarter of the whole um, budget of the US. No, there's a lot. And I think it was in, in Sanders proposed it's seven hundred uh, million dollars a year. No, and um, I think there's a lot of <laughs> you can do with this money. No, if you say, OK, defund the military, defund the police, uh, there's a, a huge um, chance to do a lot of things better if you just stop spending this money money on these things no and the same is also true for example in the in the um, in the european union with um uh with the subsidies on agricultural products no that are exported to other countries and destroy markets there no it's uh, it's a lot of practices that are really harmful and but they could be stopped within the space, no, within the European Union to change the subsidy system in the European Union. And this would already help a lot of other countries, the same with structure adjustment measures, whatever. So I think there's a chance even before creating new or, or just to, to have a space that something new can develop, it would be maybe a, a first step to stop all these very harmful practices, no, to, to implement structure adjustment measures, to um, uh, we had this thing with the debt that maybe we can talk about uh, separately again. I think this would be a first thing and then also leave space for people to to connect with each other without interfering. I think this is something um, like for my area of study, you know, I usually work on North Africa where uh, often um, South-South relations are more or less implemented by um, development agencies of the global north. No, they always try to interfere, no? like the German development agency is trying to organize meeting between different uh, countries of North Africa or uh, and try to form them in their ways. And I think it could be much, uh, a lot more can happen if, if they let let them like do their coalitions by themselves, no, without trying to pushing them in one way. So, so, and I think maybe this could also apply to to social movements, no, to have like like Alex mentioned this meeting in Bolivia, no, mm, not to dominate all these uh, coalitions already from the global north because the funding is there or because it's much easier for people from the global north to fly to the global south and to to be in these meetings like to, to leave some space to uh, let things develop before bringing the ideas from the north in there no 
if if you understand what I <laughs> what I mean. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I've, I, re I think I, I understand. I think this goes also in, in what is one of the, the participants, uh, the, the, uh, the attendees is asking. I, I'm sorry, I don't see the, the names, but um, um, saying one could, could the strategy be to lobby for limiting participation in the UN, um, UNFCCC, rather than expanding it in the sense of leveling the playing field and limiting delegation size. So this goes, I think, a bit in the, the what you are um, uh, um, saying, Juliana, is that to try to, from the north, um, uh, limit the actually the impact in the in the discussions, or to uh, yeah try to 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 leave the space. But this will also be a question of, of struggle and how do we uh, enforce that uh, that at the global level is 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 the next uh, next thought. Uh, maybe maybe Alex, you want to to have to say something on that on that point. Yeah, I'm happy to reflect a bit on that. Um, I do think determining who can be in those UNFCCC spaces is really important, um, and in other climate negotiations, you know, I think. For example, it was very clear that in health discussions, the tobacco industry should not be at the table making decisions. Similarly, in the UN climate spaces, the fossil fuel industry should not be having a seat at the table. How to make that happen in reality is quite tough, though, because the fossil fuel industry isn't just the multinational corporations, right? I think we need to kick them out because they're a bad influence. But they are also the governments of the world very often. When we think about across the world, how many governments are really captured by fossil fuel interests? And it's often some of the most powerful, right? The US, you know, quite clearly operates according to Princeton political sciences, somewhat like an oligarchy. And the Republican party is basically a lobbying wing of the fossil fuel industry. Um, so, you know, how do we kick the Republican party out? I think part of that speaks to the need for democratization to be at the heart of a lot of the climate justice pushes, reclaiming our democracies back from these very corrupting forces that uh, you know, have taken over governments across the world. And that's the same here in South Africa, where you know, civil society movements have been calling for a very different vision of climate justice than what our government is representing, because they are deeply captured by what we call the minerals energy complex here in South Africa. Um, and so, you know, how do, we, how do we limit who can be at those tables and how do we ensure that governments aren't really just the fossil fuel industry in disguise and negotiating in that way? Um, I, I think that that really does speak to, to a, a need to, to push for deep democratization. And you've seen, so in the US, for example, there's a very strong overlap between Republican legislatures that are trying to squash voting rights and those that support the fossil fuel industry. Right. And so there's that unholy nexus of, of, you know, both pretty fascist tendencies as well as authoritarian tendencies that are being weaponized to protect the fossil fuel industry. And so I think this is where the climate justice movement really needs to connect to deeper movements for, for democracy, for anti-fascism and for, for pushing back against corporate capture. Thanks a lot. And, and time is passing quite fast with those very super interesting discussions. But I think there is another couple of questions, very good questions that are going into the, um, the notions of extractivism um, that we've and that that you've you've just mentioned now. Um, so um, I just wanted to make sure I had those questions and, and read them. Um, yeah, that we have a question from from David that um, that is asking um, if you say that nation states of the majority of the world should enjoy more sovereignty, how do you handle the model of hydrocarbon drive and development? Bolivia, Venezuela, Guyana, Nigeria, Angola, Ghana, and Equatorial Guiana are exporting oil and gas resources for their own advancement. Would new global governance form restrain or enhance that trend? Um, so I think this is, I mean, this is that this has been a question uh, uh, for a long time now. Also, for uh, in in the uh, a debate in the from the left in the in the global north and the global south, uh, the question of how do uh, 
country use their natural resources uh, to, for, for development? How should they use it? What is their, um, and how do we uh, balance that with the, 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 the climate crisis? Uh, uh, and, but also put it in a, in a historical um, uh, dimension, uh, knowing that the, the climate crisis is uh, mainly uh, I mean, has been uh, triggered and, and, and uh, developed by the by, by by the exploitation from the global north on the global south. So, um, what can be done uh, to uh, make sure that those discussions are or that yeah that those uh, questions are happening in a uh, at the national level um, and um, yeah. Is it is there is there a is there an easy, easy answer to this? I, I don't think so, but maybe you have some some thoughts on this uh, provocative question. It was directed to Tete, but I think all of you are uh, have a lot to say on that. Yeah, we could have another webinar on that topic alone, no? And um, I think I. I kind of like have an idea of where that question is coming from, but I think my own view to that, it's, there's no easy answer, as you said, Nassim, No, For instance, I'm a believer that um, those countries that have really profited from the exploitation through colonialism, et cetera, et cetera, they should, you know, there should be a serious degrowth initiative. But those countries that have yet to realize their potentials, you know, for the benefit of their people under, uh, def uh, under a democratic, people-centered governance, etc., there should be uh, a recognition of the right to development. It's debatable. Now, for instance, in Venezuela, um, yeah, it's, it's, Venezuela is tricky. Of course, uh, it's a petro state, but it's also facing a lot of pressure and you know, economic sanctions, et cetera, et cetera. So there is no hard, there's not one answer to all of it. We, as you said, we have to consider all, all aspects of it. But I realize that countries that have uh, been constrained by colonialism and unfair trade deals at the moment, um, they should be encouraged to exercise their national sovereignty and their right to development. Alex, yeah, I see you want to react. Yeah, maybe to add to that, I think there definitely is this right to development that many of the the underdeveloped or previously previously colonialized or you know however you want to categorize countries that are that are struggling in the global south um and, and i think we also need to be careful about how we we develop that idea of the right to develop because i think part of the global green new deal framing is about providing the funding and the resources to allow for a different model of development but if we aren't doing that, we can't point fingers to countries and say, don't develop your oil resources, don't develop that. Um, at the same time, the, the forms of development that oil and resource extraction often engender is a deeply unequal and harmful one. Um, you know, we see the example of Nigeria where you know, there's vast energy poverty and vast poverty amidst some of the richest hydrocarbon extraction places in the world, right? And there's pollution that hits communities right by the, the oil pipelines and extraction sites and aren't receiving any of the benefits. And we see in Mozambique right now, oil multinational oil corporations are coming in under the guise of the right for Mozambique to develop. But really what they're trying to do is a very extractive model where again, they're just gonna be taking all the profits out. And so there is a sense in which this, this right to develop is, is preyed on by very profiteering corporate interests that will use it as, as a mode of extraction rather than as a mode of development. And so I think the Global Green New Deal really needs to offer a meaningful alternative to states that often in this space of desperation are turning to extractivism and to very difficult relations with multinational corporations as some of the few um, modes of development, but often driven by predatory elites within those countries who usurp that, that drive for development. 
Um, so I think that's, yeah, that's one element there. I'll leave it there, thanks. Thanks a lot. Um, Juliana, did, did you want to also answer that, that point? I think most most is already said. I, I cannot uh, add much more. I just want to add one point that's like a saying in the degrowth movement that degrowth does not mean less for all, but more for many and less for few. And I think this is very true in this regard because both in the North and in the South, inequalities are rising. No? And this is, I think, one point where there's a lot of uh, room for change and there's not just too much poverty but also too much wealth in the world <laughs> that creates a lot of problems so um yeah thanks a lot um I, there is one just one little final point that i think that was mentioned that i thought was kind of innovative and I've never thought about it. And it's a very precise question. And I think it's it's interesting because we've been uh, going on that question, uh, on that point about uh, defunding the police and military questions. And the question was, how do we bring this question to uh, spaces like the UNFCCC? So how do we bring those questions that are usually very directed to state level, the nation states, maybe to some spaces where, um, because we, you've mentioned the, the impacts, uh, well, you, we mentioned the financial uh, aspect, but there are also a lot of uh, climate change aspects in the militaries and they are uh, like the, the, the militaries are one of the biggest emitters as well. Um, so how do we address this question at the international transnational level? And we have two minutes, like I would have like one minute per, per person, that would be perfect. Oh. And maybe how does it help also to change the dynamics that we were saying? Like, can this be also an element of, um, yeah, maybe pushing uh, for global South countries to have uh, a lead on some aspects or to, yeah, to, to bring more uh, new new dynamics into those 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 forums. I know I'm not uh, I'm not helping with those uh, uns unsuspected uh, qu questions. Um, but uh, yeah, if if no one wants to answer, that's that's okay. If you if you if you think that's uh, are you no, I just want to uh, question, um, ask a question back if this is really a North-South question, because uh, working on the Middle East and North Africa, where a lot of countries are really like like Egypt, like really military uh, dictatorships, I'm not sure if these are the right, uh, uh, if they would be the first ones to call for demilitarization, no? <laughs> so. Um, I think this would need like social movements connecting between different countries, but it's not actually a north-south uh, issue, maybe. No, I think it's an important nexus: climate change, uh, militarization. But this has still to be developed, like uh, to form coalitions. No? Yeah, maybe to, to quickly chime in there. I think there is definitely a sense with the, a lot of countries in the south are implicated in that element too. South Africa often acts in a sub-imperial role, protecting fossil fuel interests like in Mozambique now, um, and in different spaces is driving that. Um, and Saudi Arabia and Israel form an unholy alliance um, that often tries to protect oil interests and facilitates US imperialism. So there, there really is a sense in which we need to unpack and tackle this some of the most powerful states in the world that are that are driving this and are often the ones in the UNFCCC that are also blocking climate action and pushing us backwards, right? And so unless we tackle those deep power structures um, and often the, the forms of extortion that goes on with the UNFCCC where the US will make aid conditional on this, this and that going on here, uh, if we're not tackling that, those sorts of power, relations, I think we're going to be struggling to make meaningful change within the UNFCCC. That obviously makes this problem a lot harder and more intractable, but unless we're thinking seriously about that, it's, it's hard to, to see the sorts of transformational change that really is what the Global Green New Deal is about.
Have a good day. Great, thank you. Did, 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 did you want to add something? Yeah, a little bit of an advertisement because we have a, a participant here who comes from IPS, Laura Steichen. Uh, they produce this excellent book, No Warming, No no warming, no war, that makes that links about climate change and militarism. So it's really, really good because they're already bringing this advocacy in the COP spaces, no? um, highlighting the role of the U.S. government, but also broadening this conversation of, on how you know, corporate-led environmental destruction, <laughs> uh, usually... Uh, with corporations coming from the global north, you know, doing their business in the global south, aided by the military and the police apparatus and corrupt governments in the global south. So this whole infrastructure that really profits from extractivism, that fuels climate crisis, that brings about war, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. No, so these are the things that we are already raising at the COP spaces, and I think in Madrid. It, this was really very evident no? during COP25, civil society, we were actually driven out of the COP, you know, by, by private security forces that the UN has hired to protect government and corporations. So people who are speaking truth to power were driven out of the UN space. So I think this, if this could really be you know a very important conversation i think we may have hit a very raw nerve and that could be the power that we uh we have yet to unleash yeah well thank you very much uh Tete, and maybe we will uh we will wrap up and finish from the with those with those words um uh, i would like really to thank uh the how free panelists juliana uh, Tete and Alex for, for those very great discussions today and thank also our participants who really engaged and triggered us and uh, yeah allowed us to go into uh, very important questions. I would like to um, remember the, you that we we are launching today actually the, the Green Deals um, Green New Deals publication by Juliana that you can find on our, on our website and our new website that the Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung Foundation is actually providing to those kind of discussions. We want to be uh, enhancing and, and, and supporting those, those discussions on, on, on global uh, transformative plans. So um, on that note, thank you very much to, to everyone who, who attended. And I think there are a lot of uh, food for thoughts and for future discussions. <laughs>